Hi, this is ETF.com's Exchange Traded Fridays podcast, a weekly podcast covering developments in the ETF industry. My name is Sumit Roy, and I'm Senior ETF Analyst for ETF.com. This week, we got a special episode for you all. We're recording this at the Inside ETFs conference in Hollywood, Florida. Even better, I've got multiple great guests lined up for this episode, so stick around till the end. We'll be talking with Matthew Tuttle and Anakit Ulal later in the show. But first, we got Brian Kelleher, Chief Revenue Officer, and Eric McArdle, Managing Director of Advisor Solutions for Simplify, an options-focused ETF issuer. Brian, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So you guys are all about option strategies at Simplify. It seems to me option strategies have really caught on recently, and we've seen big inflows, particularly into covered call equity strategies. Have you seen a sea change when it comes to the demand for option strategies? Well, I think the, the major change you're seeing has definitely been in with, within the ETF structure. So a lot of these strategies have been around for a very long time. Um, options-based strategies, but they've been in the structure of you know, hedge funds, private funds, structured products that were often you know, very expensive, hard to access. Um, so having them in the structure of an ETF that you know, are available from everyone from institutions to individual investors, I think that's where you're, you've seen the sea change. So there's a number of issuers out there that are, are focused on options-based strategies. Sim Simplify is one of them. Um, we've got some interesting, unique solutions, and uh, so far what we've been doing has been resonating well with investors. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of those strategies. The biggest ETF you have and the one that's seen the most demand this year is the Simplify Volatility Premium ETF, ticker symbol SVOL. It's had year-to-date inflows of 140 million and it's risen about 7.4%. Nice return. Tell us how this strategy works. Yeah, so SVOL is something that we're very proud of at Simplify. Uh, it's a, the brainchild of uh, former PIMCO team uh, and really thinking about ways to bring income to investors using the volatility premium, which is often thought of as short vol, whether you're doing that. Um, in our case, we're using VIX futures, um, but you'll see that you mentioned covered calls being a popular implementation for short volatility and for income. Uh, we think that there's a structural advantage to using VIX futures for this exposure but one of the concerns with doing so, of course, is the potential risk. And we take that into consideration when building the strategy, focusing on risk management, and then continuing to provide consistent income to end investors. Yeah, that idea of options premium harvesting is something that you're really seeing resonate in the market. So doing it in a, in a, in a way that's focused on risk management and providing these solutions is something that's you know, as, as the flows have shown, is is resonating. And then, you know, the yield profile on something like SVOL, it's got a 17% plus distribution yield right now. It's hard to miss for investors. So um, they like that one. Absolutely. It's I developed can... its own little fan club. It's fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great to see. So am I getting this right? This essentially harvests the roll yields that you get from shorting the VIX futures. That's exactly right. Okay, okay. So, of course, the short VIX trade was very popular. I don't know, it was like five, ten years ago or so. Yep. Then we had that event called Volmageddon in 2018 or so, and a bunch of VIX, short VIX ETFs blew up. Now, a lot of people look at that and they thought, okay, the short VIX trade is now over, but SVOL is now back. And it's a little bit different, right? It's not as leveraged as those ETFs were. And you got this option strategy that kind of protects the ETF. So how would it, this type of strategy have performed during that Volmageddon period? So of course, SVOL uh, was launched in 2021. So when speaking about this, you know, we have to kind of think back to you know, historical market environments. And you know, really, if you think about the volatility premium, uh, we know that it's a market feature, right? It's a structural aspect of risk uh, taking. And a lot of folks kind of, you know, you think about this as a free lunch, right? But the problem is so many firms before have come in and gorged themselves at this free lunch to the point where they get themselves in trouble. And for SFAL, you know, we think about managing risk in two different ways. One, we limit the exposure to that short VIX trade to make sure that we're never in a period where you have any you know, knockout risk essentially. But beyond that, we then hedge the tails, which is, you know, what you alluded to in the Volmageddon event where VIX can have, you know, explosive moves to the upside 
that can knock out a strategy entirely. And we do that by buying VIX or VIX equivalent call options. Uh, they're typically about 100 to 150 percent out of the money. And so for us, again, it's just maintaining that role profile, capturing that structural um, you know, volatility premium, but doing so in a way where we're never exposed to catastrophic risk. No, that, that sounds very prudent to me. The next ETF of yours that I want to talk about, and something also you know, very newsworthy, is Maxi, which is your Bitcoin strategy plus income ETF. <laughs> this one's kind of interesting because it is your best performing ETF so far this year, up 60%. But it's a Bitcoin strategy that also generates income. When people think Bitcoin, they don't necessarily think income. How does that work? Yeah, and, and so that's, that's the key. I mean, a lot of investors in Bitcoin and crypto tend to be long-term holders, right? So if you look at the holding statistics, you know, the, the turnover as a percentage of ownership is, is surprisingly low for a lot of people. Um, so how do we provide a solution to those long-term investors and you know, have their money actually work for them? And the idea of having income coming off of the strategy uh, makes a lot of sense. So you know, we originally kind of had uh, thought of the idea of having almost like a covered call strategy for Bitcoin. Uh, SEC wouldn't let us do it. So you know, what we've done is essentially you're doing a, a different way of options, har options premium harvesting. So essentially writing uh, put spreads on equity and fixed income indices, and that generates a relatively attractive income profile. So what we're trying to do is you know, provide access to those investors that want exposure to Bitcoin via um, the futures market. So you're getting the exposure via futures to Bitcoin while providing an attractive yield profile for those you know, buy and hold investors in Bitcoin. That's really cool. And are you guys optimistic about you know, crypto in an ETF wrapper longer term? Uh, as, as far as spot goes? Yeah, yeah. We're, we, we don't have a view on that. Okay. We think uh, you know, the, the SEC is, is, is doing a great job. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we don't have a horse in the race. We essentially, you know, believe that we can provide good exposure to Bitcoin or other asset classes with, uh, with you know, how the landscape looks now. Fair enough. And another one of your funds that caught my eye is the Simplify Healthcare ETF ticker symbol PINK. You actually donate all of the profit from this fund to a charity. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's just awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about this ETF? Yeah, and this, this was um, another strategy that had an interesting genesis. And this, um, at Simplify, we've got some wonderful macro thinkers, and um, we're having a great internal debate about you know, the pros and cons of ESG. And one of the things that we kept coming back to was ESG tends to be very opaque, right? There's different sets of rules for different strategies, and you know, who's writing those rules? Um, you know, it, it, it creates a lot of questions, and you're seeing that play out in real time. It's become, a, unfortunately, a, a pretty polarizing subject, right? So um, we didn't have a view on launching a specific ESG strategy, but we wanted to do something that was impactful. So the idea of launching an ETF where we would give 100% of the profits to an organization um, where we could really quantify and, and make a difference, that appealed to us. So, you know, immediately kind of begged the question, okay, what organization? Um, cancer is something that affects everyone. My mother's a survivor. You know, there's a lot of there's you know multiple cancer survivors that simplify, and that one, you know, we were we kind of arrived there very quickly, um, and you know we we're fortunate to have a, a friend of the firm who's on the board of Komen made contact with Komen. We we you know told them the idea. They loved it, and um, so that's what we've done. And you know, as we were constructing it, you know, we were originally thinking, okay, how could we construct an index-based product that would you know. Um, healthcare focus that would benefit and we were thinking about you know number of years uh, saved so we were different thinking about different methodologies and um, a friend of the firm uh, one of our people reached out to a, a gentleman by the name of Michael Taylor Mike's background is um, he ran the health book at Citadel Millennium um, just a phenomenal investor in healthcare very well regarded and we you know told him what we were doing and you know, tried to pick his brain. He's like, well, why don't you guys just manage this actively? And I was like, well, we, we don't want to, we can't really pay for a sub-advisor because we're not, we're not taking any profits. And he's like, well, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. So Mike Taylor is doing it fully pro bono. Um, the strategy has been going great. It's getting a lot of attention. It's got a phenomenal pick, uh, ticker, P-I-N-K. So we're, uh, you know, it's, it's right now, it's about 60 million in assets. Uh, but, you know, we, we're getting a lot of interest and we feel that that one will be a, 
over 100 and hopefully in the not too distant future. And every dollar we raise, you know, a significant portion of that goes to Susan G. Komen in their fight for a cure for breast cancer. That's awesome. What a great thing you guys are doing with that. And before I let you go, Brian, Eric, is there anything else you want to add? I know we touched on a few of your ETFs. Are there others you want to highlight or anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's a few, right? And one of the things that and we do at Simplify is really make hard-to-reach exposure, exposures accessible, right? So whether we're using payer swaps to protect investors against uh, increases in bond volatility or interest rate risk, or using things like you know, futures to get uh, access to capital efficiency across the treasury term structure, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of things that you know, really are focused on the pain points of the current modern portfolio, right? So uh, we encourage listeners to, to check us out. Um, on our website, you can go to simplify.us and just hit the contact us button and we're happy to talk through any problems that you might have. Absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure having you both on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next up, we have Aniket Ulal, who's the head of ETF Data and Analytics at CFRA. Aniket, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Amit. Great to be here. So, Aniket, I know you wrote up an article recently looking at flows and performance in various segments of the ETF market. Can you talk about that? Sure, Sumit. So, you know what we do at CFR is we uh, obviously um, have a large database of ETF flows, performance globally. And recently, we took a look at what's happening with ETF flows in the U.S. And it's been pretty interesting to look at flows because in some ways, flows have been very different from what we're seeing in the in the secondary market with equities. Uh, obviously, the S&P 500 is up 8 to 9% this year. But if you look at flows, uh, we are seeing investors become much more defensive. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is we've seen this trend across asset classes. So if we look at the, for example, in the commodity space, we've seen very significant rotation into gold ETFs. Mm -hmm. Last year, as you know, gold didn't perform as... Uh, we expected, right, in a market right. when a 60-40 portfolio is down one of the most historically, one would have expected gold to do well. Right. But gold was actually marginally down last year. It lost about $3 billion in flows, gold ETFs last year. This year we've seen gold ETFs taken over $2 billion in flows. Um, gold itself is up um, significantly. Gold ETFs are done well. And gold miners, which tend to kind of do very well when gold is up and kind of magnify that the return, yeah. have also done really well. So um, to us, that's a sign that, you know, investors are being more defensive. Part of it maybe, you know, is just driven by obviously concerns about the debt ceiling. But there's probably also broader macroeconomic issues around inflation, which even though it's moderating is still high, rates mm -hmm. tend to be are still high. Mm -hmm. So certainly on the commodity side, we have seen gold kind of bounce back, um, kind of regain its luster, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, it's interesting because everyone looked at the performance in 2022 and gold kind of didn't do as well as people thought in the face of 40-year high inflation. It's kind of a delayed reaction almost that we're seeing in gold. Yeah, part of it also may be um, linked to the dollar. Generally, the dollar and gold tend to have an inverse relationship. Last year, we did see a very strong dollar. We saw the dollar you know, move up about 12% relative to trade-weighted basket of currencies. Mm -hmm. So that may partly explain why gold was a little weak, because obviously a lot of demand for gold comes from emerging markets, and a stronger dollar makes that gold is priced in dollars. So that may be part of the explanation. Um, this year, obviously, the dollar hasn't been as strong. And so that may be one of the reasons we've seen gold, apart from all the macroeconomic yeah. factors I mentioned, that yeah. may be a factor here. Great so. point. Yeah, it's easy to forget that the vast majority of gold demand comes from outside of the United States. Anikit, I know you also participated in a panel at Inside ETFs uh, yesterday. And since we are at the conference right now, I have to ask you about that. I think the discussion surrounded how advisors can build portfolios that better align with their clients. Can you talk about that panel? Sure, it was, it was a great discussion. We had representation from, you know, the financial planning side. We had um, somebody, John, from Calamos, so the asset management side. And, of mm -hmm. course, I was representing kind of the independent research nice. um, community and providing that perspective, which touched on a couple of um, different themes that I think are top of mind for advisors right now. The first thing we started with was, you know, what does it mean to act in a client's best interest? So, uh, you know, I was I was kind of touched on the fact that to really, for advisors to follow that Reg BI and, and meet the fiduciary standard in spirit, what it really means is knowing your product, knowing the risk reward, the cost, being able to compare products, 
and that's really for us as an as an independent um, data provider and research provider kind of uh, we take that seriously because advisors rely on our ratings and research to make the recommendations so we talk, talked a little bit about that we talked a little bit about ESG uh, which um, I, I did mention on the um, you know in the panel that I, I see ESG is treading water a little bit it's been still less than 2% of assets um, because of one or two large ETFs they've lost ESG has actually lost money this year mm -hmm. Um, but I think there was a feeling on the panel that that could be a short-term trend. We may see a turnaround. Mm -hmm. It's still a nascent kind of um, okay. category. And did you guys get a chance to talk about AI since that's on everyone's mind? We, we did. We did touch on AI. Um, obviously, AI is um, you know it's it's in it's in the early stages, right? So I think a lot of what we say is quite speculative, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> My my own view, at least the view I kind of voiced on the panel, was that AI is not so much about just the models; it's about the data and research that feeds into the models. Mm -hmm. And as uh, a firm that sits on top of lots of proprietary data and research, um, for example, our technical research goes back almost 50 years. Mm -hmm. So for us to be able to take some of that data and research and feed that into the models, for us, it's really exciting mm -hmm. because then we can strengthen those models, and those models can then empower advisors. Mm -hmm. So we kind of felt like AI is probably more an empowerment tool and it's never going to fully replace that human connection that advisors uh, have, even though of course things are going to change. I mean, it's not like everything's great. I'm sure there's going to be threats from AI as well and maybe some jobs will be um, threatened or some roles may change, but overall we see it as an opportunity. That's great. I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to be encouraged to hear that. Now, before I let you go, Anakit, I want to ask you about two very popular ETFs this year, Qual and Jeppy. Can we go through them one by one? And I just want to know your take. Why are they so popular? What do you think of these ETFs? Why don't we start with Qual? So Qual is basically holds companies that are, um, you know, have high return on equity, low financial leverage, strong cash flows. So it's really, I think we think the success of these ETFs has been driven by investor demand for kind of safer investments in an environment where, like I mentioned, there's macroeconomic concerns, as well as obviously the debt ceiling debate. I think partly what's driven Qual's demand is also um, some asset allocators and people building models have allocated to Qual, yeah. and that resulted in a very sharp uptick in, in flows actually in March. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about Qual is that it actually holds quite a lot of technology mm -hmm. and technology has actually done really well this year. Yeah. So Qual has actually performed better than the uh, S&P 500 or SPY. Um, that's not been the case with all quality factor ETF. Some of them have much more of a exposure to energy. And mm -hmm. so energy, of course, has been challenged this year. Right. So Qual has actually done better than most of its, its peers this year. Interesting. And, and what about Jeppy? This is probably the most popular ETF this year. Right. Well, Jeppy, I think, continues. It's an interesting strategy because it combines a low wall exposure with a covered call options writing strategy on top of it. So I think the reason why um, investors like it is because obviously it generates a lot of income through the call writing. Yeah. But then the nice thing about it is that if the investors do have the equity risk, it's still low wall equities. Yeah. And so it's really, I think it's a product for its times. I think it's, it's kind of appropriate for this yeah. environment. That yeah. probably explains why it, it uh, but I think it is important to understand that a covered call strategy is always going to outperform, I'm, I'm sorry, underperform in the markets going up sharply, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because the upside is capped to some extent yeah. by that. So as long as investors understand, uh, I, I, I think of it as that's not a bug, that's a feature of the product. Yeah. And I think one needs to understand that a low wall strategy with covered call writing is going to, it's, it's going to underperform the broader market. Yeah. But we have seen interest in that. And I think it broadly reflects the evolution of the ETF space towards these kind of more slightly more complex, you know, options-based yeah. strategies um, and more towards kind of structured product. Absolutely. Uh, and we yeah. can't forget this is an actively managed ETF. So That's a lot true. of the performance is going to come from the stock picking ability of the managers. True. Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. Well, Anakit, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Sumit. Great being here. Next up is Matthew Tuttle, who I'm really excited to speak with. Matthew, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. So, Matthew, you've been very, very busy over the past few years. You launched a super successful ETF that was an inverse ARK ETF. Then you sold that ETF 
then you launched a Jim Cramer themed ETF. I just want to know what you and your firm are focused on today. So we're focused on a lot of different things. Um, I'm kind of ADD like that, where <laughs> I, I, I go in a million different directions. Uh, so you know, we just filed for a 2x long and a 2x short on ARC. Uh, you know, we think there's some demand for that on the 2x side. Yeah. We also just, uh, in partnership with the guys at RecShares, filed for 2x long, short, Tesla, and NVIDIA. Yeah. You know, single stock ETFs just hit a billion, right. um, I think, yesterday. So, you know, I think they've been successful. Um, and I think we've learned a lot about single stock ETFs and where the demand is going to be. So we're going to be active in that. Uh, we're also working on a new project that I can't really talk much about right now, but it, I think it's an underserved area you know, in the ETF space. So hopefully within the next month or two, we'll, we'll be able to have some more to say about that. Um, and then there's some smaller projects yeah. we're working on, yeah. but you know, we're, we're keeping busy. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing more. Now, you did say you are launching the 2X ARC ETFs. Do you think this whole Kathy Wood phenomenon has legs? Is she going to still be in the limelight, even though her ETFs have performed quite poorly over the last year and a half? So she's still going to be in the limelight because that's, I mean, that's what she does. <laughs> You know, regardless of performance, the media keeps trotting her out. You know, whatever she says, whatever she yeah. does is news. You know, and from our standpoint, it's a great tactical trading vehicle. You know, it, it is going to move, it, whether that's up, whether that's down. And, you know, we do a lot with the retail traders. And, you know, we, we do think there's a demand for 2x long and 2x short. Cool, cool. And then you did mention also the single stock ETFs that you're launching. So I take it you think the single stock ETF phenomenon has legs as well. I do if you've got the right stocks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a retail thing. Yeah. You know, you're not going to see institutional investors buying this yeah. stuff. But if you're, tra if you're trading the stocks the retail guys like, and, you know, and you've got to have entree into that world. And we're constantly talking to retail investors on discords, on social media. And the rec shares guys are doing the same thing with their micro sectors. So to us, it was just, it was a great synergy. And we do think that's got legs in the right names with the right leverage ratio. Gotcha. Now, since I have you here with me, I got to ask you about SGIM, your inverse Jim Cramer ETF. It's got around $5 million in AUM today. This is a very, very unique product. It got a lot of media attention when you first talked about it. Um, as I understand it, it takes a lot of work to kind of make this strategy operate. Can you tell us how it's been managing this fund over the past you know, few months? So it is a lot of work. Uh, I mean, it's been a learning experience. You know, the tough part is we've got to watch them right. you know, every day. But you know, we can watch some stuff on tape and fast forward through a lot of the you know, the booyah stuff that, <laughs> that, that we don't care for. Um, but it's been a learning experience, and, and we've kind of shifted it a little bit. When we first kind of came up with the idea, I thought, you know, I'd run it like an index fund. So everything he said, buy, 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 or sell, 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 was actionable, which also meant we couldn't hold on to things for a long period of time. And... What we found is, you know, things like Silicon Valley Bank, which would have been in the portfolio, but would have had to come out before it went to zero. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other names like that, you know, we thought that wasn't the ideal strategy. So we've kind of shifted where now what Jim says goes on a watch list and we can kind of pick and choose from that list. That allows us to have a more concentrated portfolio on L Jim and S Jim and allows us to be much more, more responsive to what's going on in the market. Cause you know, he may mention a stock and it may keep going up for a while. And then a month later, you know, it goes down 50%. We want to be able to capitalize on those movements. That's great. So this has got to be like one of the most unique ETFs on the market today. Yeah. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff we like. Um, you know, to me, I, I'm, I'm a trader myself. I trade my own account. Mm -hmm. And I've always noticed that the, the consensus is almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. 
And I've been looking, you know, how do you monetize that? And the beauty of Jim Cramer is he's a consensus on steroids. Right. <laughs> you know, he's got to swing at every pitch. And, yeah. you know, the results of him swinging at every pitch speak for themselves. Yeah. Consensus on steroids. I love that. So you've been a big innovator in the ETF space, as we've talked about. Broadly speaking, I know you can't talk about the specific ETFs you have coming down. What can we expect from you in the future um, when it comes to ETFs? Innovative. Uh, you know, we're always looking at first of its kind ideas and, you know, controversial. I, you know, there are areas that I think are underserved in the ETF space, but I think maybe people are afraid, you know, to go into. Yeah. Um, you know, we're always going to look at stuff, though, from an investment perspective. There's got to be a use case. You know, I see so many ETFs out there that, you know, th that are just gimmicky yeah. and there's no real use case yeah. for them. I mean, there's things that we've looked at and rejected that then somebody else does. And I'm looking yeah. at it, I'm like, eh, you know, it, it's I, I mean, it's a fun idea, but there's no use case for it. You know, we're always going to want to make sure there's a use case, but. You know, there's no area that we're not afraid to touch, as hopefully uh, people will soon see. <laughs> Fantastic. Looking forward to hearing more about that. But before I let you go, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, no. I mean, I think, uh, you know, you, we, we've covered a lot of the main points. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find this and all other Exchange Traded Fridays episodes on ETF.com or on any major podcast platform. See you next week.